that okay? Can you hear me like? So I have the unenviable just before lunchtime slot. Um, let's try and keep it the time. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some modeling experiments, um, very much in the you know continuation of what Eileen has just been presenting. Um, so, yeah. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, the the influence of the extratropics on generally on propagating signals within the tropics. Um, so this is work I've done with Severin Thibault and Patrick Marchisiello. And uh, so I was going to start with a kind of just a list of references. Uh, um, so, but uh, we've had so much uh, kind of quality review material just up to now. I don't really need to say very much. Uh, Especially on the models here, um, Hyalin has just spoken about uh, some of these uh, modeling studies where they've taken the, a model of the tropical band and tried to look at how uh, the boundary conditions can influence uh, the simulation that you get in, in those models. And a lot of that work has been done. Uh, originally, I think the, the, the first paper, which is the kind of progenitor of what I'm going to show, is from Gustafsson and Weir, where they took... Uh, um, and then five and, and in, a, in a regional domain around uh, the maritime continent and found that the boundary conditions were crucial for propagating the MJO. That was kind of short case studies. And then Palav Ray and Chidong Zhang did a series of papers on isolating different aspects of the boundary conditions and how important they are, not just the lateral boundaries, but also the communication around the tropical band. And they found that both of those things are important, but particularly the lateral boundaries, the boundaries with the extra tropics. Uh, they found that was necessary to have those right in order to have a, uh, a simulation which was capable of propagating an MJO. So what what do I contribute to this? Um, a lot of this stuff is kind of short runs, case studies, and it's almost like anecdotal if you're looking at a single case. And so my contribution was to do a longer run, 20 years, and have a bit more of a thorough examination um, to try and find, try and bring out the systematic behavior, the generic systematic behavior of these models, um, looking at a more statistical sample of boundary conditions. So what is our hypothesis? What, which of these pictures do you think best represents the uh, influence of the tropic, the extra tropics on the tropics? Um, Top left, top left is a forced response, okay? So is it a forced, do the extra tropics basically control what happens in the tropics? Or is it more like this one, a stochastically excited internal mode? So these bells, they ring in a certain way. It doesn't really matter how you shake them. They're going to ring the same way, okay? Or is it the girl on the swing? Um, that's a resonant response. She needs to be pushed in a certain way. And if you don't push her right, She's not going to swing, and she's not going to be happy, OK? Or is it Jimmy? Jimmy, um, he can hold that perfect note. He can sustain it by having the right feedback with his amp. And it'll just ring on. Um, so is it an unstable internal mode of the tropics? So we can fiddle with the boundary conditions and try and, try and at least eliminate some of these hypotheses. And uh, that's what we're going to try and do with a modeling study. So. First, the sort of caveat on these types of modeling studies, though. Um, this is reality, OK? Uh, this is the extra tropics, and this, this is the tropics. And we arbitrarily, almost, draw some lines, which is the, the limits of our domain. And we'd said, this is, our, this is our domain, and this is external to our domain, all right? And so from that conception, we will we'll interpret reality like this. We'll say, in our domain, we have the tropical solution. And external to our domain, we have the mid-latitudes, which will supply boundary conditions for our experiment. So from that premise, we will then perform an experiment. And the experiment in blue now means it's a model, OK? Um, so we have these boundary conditions from observed extratropics, and we have uh, the model solution. So I don't know if you can see where I'm going with this, but this is philosophically not robust, because what if there's a problem? with the experiment. There's no reason to suppose 
that the conditions on these boundaries um, is entirely the result of what's happening in the extratropics. It could also be the result of, of the observed solution um, within the tropics. So maybe these boundaries should be red and not green, okay? So are we feeding our model domain with external influence, or are we just echoing back the observed uh, realization within the tropics back into our model, or some combination of the two? We're not sure about that, okay? And none of these studies uh, really solve this problem. So I'm, I'm going to call that the elephant in the room, okay? So I don't know if you know what that expression means. The elephant in the room is, is uh, everybody agrees not to talk about this very obvious big thing which is there. Uh, we just talk about something else, right? So I'm not going to talk about it either, not to start with, but I will come back to it towards the end. We, we, this is our experimental procedure. We impose boundary conditions from observations in a tropical channel run. So where do we put these boundaries? Um, I'm going to show you a short movie. Uh, it's short. It's just a case study. It's anecdotal. But this is the observed 850 millibar wind, uh, zone of wind. This is a wharf simulation, model simulation. Um, I'll get to what wharf means in a minute. Um, with t the boundaries at 20 north and 20 south, and then this is with the boundaries at 30 north and 30 south. And we'll just, just see if we can see an uh, event propagating through with those two different uh, choices for the positions of the boundaries, and, and is it any different between these two runs? And it's very difficult to tell just from a case study, but I mean, here it goes. You can see uh, something's going to propagate through here. And it's difficult to look at all three of them at the same time, but it'll cycle around. But there it goes. It's going through. Yeah. Um, and so it, it seems to happen okay in both, in both simulations. Um, there's a slight difference between the second one and the third one, but I think we can sort of, we can be reassured that we can um, confidently try to simulate this kind of propagating system uh, with the boundaries at 30 north and 30 south, which I think is the safer choice given the caveat um, that I showed you earlier. I don't know if you noticed the subliminal message uh, in, in this video that that that, um, that was for a different presentation. I was I was trying to persuade people back home the French. They love their acronyms, and um, I was trying to persuade them to form a group on, a group on ocean atmosphere teleconnections. Um, all right, so what is our experimental um, procedure? Because we want to isolate the influence of the boundary um, on the tropical solution. So we'll do this with the WRF, Weather Research and Forecasting Model. Um, with the boundaries at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, um, we, on those boundaries, we'll impose the NCEP2 reanalysis. Uh, there's, a, there's a specification of the model. It's a one degree resolution. And we'll do the following experiments. We'll do 20 year runs from 1993 to 2012. And for each run, we do it twice. We'll do twin experiments. I'll get back to that in a second. So what do we do with these boundary conditions? We have a reference run where the boundary is everything and it excludes Nothing. So we just put the NCEP reanalysis on the boundaries. Then there's what we call a notch run. I borrowed that terminology from Gustafsson and Weir, who did a similar experiment. And on the boundary, we put the diurnal cycle, the synoptic scales, the annual cycle, interannual variability, everything except this band of frequencies, the MJO band, which we remove. Okay, so that's why it's a, it's a notch. And then we have a climatology run where we put every, where we take away everything except diurnal cycle and the annual, uh, a, a repeated annual cycle, which is the same every year. So there's no interannual variability, no low frequency, or even synoptic variability, uh, just this, okay? Then there's a couple of other runs where we, th these things are done to the boundaries and also to the sea surface temperature. So that to isolate the separate influence of those two, we do a couple of crossed experiments. Ref star, which is like ref, but with SSTs from notch, and notch star, which is like notch, but with SSTs from ref, okay? Just to check that the SSTs aren't too important in our, our conclusions. And for each of these runs, we do it twice. So 20-year um, runs, one is with the initial conditions from the beginning of 1993, and the other, we just bang in the 1st of January 1994 as the initial condition. Nothing else changes, and it'll be a shock 
but it'll be a shock which the model adjusts to after a month or two. And after that, what we have is two identical runs with identical boundary conditions, um, and the difference between the two of them, we, we treat as if it's internal variability in the model. Okay? So um, that's another way of looking at the importance of the boundary. The difference between those two twin runs uh, is independent of the boundary conditions. And yet, it's consistent with having realistic boundary conditions. Um, so here's the kind of validation. This is the winter state of the simulation. So here are average fields for shading is precipitation and contours is low level zone of wind. This is the, here's the observations. Here's the reference run. So the wind is the right sign, well placed, a little bit strong. The rainfall is a little bit strong as well, but it's very well positioned. Um, the notch run is very similar. Um, and the climatology run is rather poor. And that is because it's missing those crucial synoptic time scale transient momentum fluxes, which screws up the uh, climatology in the, in the tropics. And so we get a poor simulation uh, because we're missing important fluxes on the boundary. Um, so how about the variance? Um, so here I've show, I'm showing you the reference runs, and I'm showing you the two twin reference runs, and we're looking at the variance of 850 millibar wind again. And we see that there are places in the maritime continent where it is maximum. Uh, it's a bit strong compared to the observations. It's extremely similar between these two runs, as you'd expect. Uh, this is 20-year average variance. Okay? And this is the variance of the difference between these two runs. It's not the difference between these two pictures. Okay? It's the variance of the these two different time series. If you take the time series, these two time series, subtract one from the other, you'll get a difference time series. It's the variance of that. Okay? And so what do we expect? What do we expect it to look like? Um, well, the variance of two of the difference between two things is the variance of the one plus the variance of the other minus two times the covariance. All right? So imagine that these two things are completely independent. Then they'll have zero covariance, and this should be twice as big as this. All right? Or imagine that they are perfectly correlated. All right? Then this will cancel with these two, and there'll be nothing here. All right? Somewhere in between the two, what we have is a measure of how um, how independent these two runs are, okay? And the only thing that makes these two runs not independent, the fact that they're not independent, is because they have the same boundary conditions, right? So the, the, the degree to which they're not independent is also the degree to which the boundary conditions are important. So what do we see? We see that the difference here is not twice as big as this, but it's not zero. It's about the same, right? Which makes us think that, well, the boundary conditions are important in determining the variance here. There are, they, they account for about half of it. And the other half is internal variance. Okay? So that's one way of looking at it. Here's another way. Let's look at the notch run. <coughs> now, the notch run has weaker variance than the reference run, okay? so which, which implies what I just said, that some of that variance is coming from the boundary conditions, and it's coming from the boundary conditions on those MJO timescales, because that's what's been removed here, remember, for these notch runs. These runs are the same as the reference runs, except we've removed MJO timescales from the boundary conditions. The difference between the two of them is closer to twice the variance here, okay? Which, again, it, which implies that um, this variability that we're seeing here is basically internal variability. We've removed the boundary influence. Now let's just go back, okay? That's with full boundary conditions. This is, um, so, so the, the structure is quite similar, okay? But the magnitude has gone down by about half, okay? It's all very consistent. If we look at the climatology run, um, same story, the difference is twice as big and this is all internal, but it, the structure is totally different because the climatology is very poor. We've, we've uh, ruined the basic state by removing too much uh, 
uh, high frequency information from the boundaries. So this is not a useful experiment. Well, it's useful as a benchmark, but it's not a good experiment because it messes with the time mean. And, and Ray and Zhang had this same problem with their, their work. Um, so here's a summary slide. So run reference, notch, climb, and here's the, this is the variance, and this is the variance of the difference. You see, this gets weaker, this gets stronger. I've lost my yeah, back. Okay. Um, right. Let's move on. Um, oh yeah, a quick talk about a, a quick word about the mixed boundary conditions. So this is the reference run again. Remember, this is the ref star run. So this is the run in which I have um, the boundary conditions the same, but the SST is from this notch run, and you can see it looks very much like ref which kind of implies that the SSTs don't, are not the determining factor. It's more to do with the lateral boundaries. The notch star run is the opposite experiment. It's like the notch run, except the lateral boundaries, uh, sorry, except the SST is from the ref run. And it looks like the notch run, again, implying that it's the lateral boundaries which are determining the solution, not the SSTs. Okay. Um, so how does it propagate? Does, it, does this model, is this model able to propagate this signal? This is a Hofmüller of correlation, okay? Uh, one point correlation at this point here with the OLR. So what we see shaded in colors is the OLR and the contours are the zonal winds at low level. And this is a lag from minus 20 to 20 days, function of longitude. So we see uh, obviously, we have a, a, a correlation of one here. The observations you see this OLR signal propagating eastwards with time, and the wind structure. Well, basically, you have low-level convergence where you have enhanced convection, and it's propagating at MJO speeds, and it speeds up over the Pacific. Uh, this is a, a signal that is a well-known MJO signal, which we're trying to simulate with the model. Here's the ref run. It has some aspects of the convection signal propagating. It does do that to some extent, but not as well as you might hope. It's basically a large part of it is a standing oscillation. But the winds do propagate, and they do it in quite a realistic way. Okay, so we're fairly happy with the simulation, the dynamical simulation here. Um, and it, it changes its phase speed as it, as it goes into the Pacific, just like in the observations. And we have these precursors here um, for the next event. In, uh, in the west, in, in the mid Pacific. So um, that's the reference run. Okay, let's look at all the runs. Uh, so again, here's the same one that we saw before. This is the. So in the next column is the twin run. So run one, run two, and the difference between the two. So you see that the reference run. Twin runs look the same. The difference between the two does not have that nice propagating signal. It has, it kind of dies over the Pacific. It's not able to keep it going. Um, then the notch run, um, it, it's not quite as bad, but it doesn't have those strong precursors, and it looks rather weak when you get to the mid-Atlantic. Um, and the difference, this difference field is not so different to these ones as that is to these ones, okay? So we are missing important information from the boundaries, and it's affecting the propagation. The climatology run is rather poor. Um, so another way to look at that is to look at one-point correlation maps. And here we have many of them, okay? Um, so this is the simultaneous correlation of the low-level wind with OLR in this box. So this is the the Indian Ocean, okay? And you can see um, that you have westerlies here. Uh, so yeah, easterlies here, westerlies here. Uh, yeah, because this is keyed on positive OLR, which is suppressed convection. So, so that's low-level divergence there. Um, but you, it doesn't really matter. The sign, uh, it, it's, it's a linear analysis. So, so um, then you see the propagation downstream after that. And you see these precursors upstream. Of, of, of the correlation point, okay? And the reference, uh, ref you can see a kind of rosby gyre structure here in the, uh, in the response as well. It's like, a, it's like a response to deep convection. Um, 
And the reference run gets a lot of that structure. Um, the magnitude is slightly weaker than in the observations, but it's all there. Then if you look at the notch run, um, the, the simultaneous response looks similar, but the um, upstream precursors are definitely, definitely weak. Okay. Um, and the downstream propagation, you don't have that same sense of propagation. So there's a difference here. And uh, it's consistent with the hoff Willers I just showed. Um, so we can sort of draw some conclusions now. So we don't believe it's just a forced response because we think I mean, those variance patterns in the notch run look very similar to the variance patterns in the reference run. So the structure looks as if it's internal to the tropics. It's not imposed by the extratropics. And yet it is amplified by the signal coming in from the extratropics, especially on MJO time scales. Um, it may be that it's so, so the fact that I haven't ruled out the idea that it's some sort of internal mode, which is stochastically forced. Uh, it may well also be something that needs to be hit at the right frequency. That seems to be one of the conclusions from this work. And I don't believe it's just an unstable internal mode, although Jimmy might make a comeback if we talk about global instability. Um, that's something I haven't addressed with this experiment. So on to the next thing, which is, all right, that's all just to do with variance. Have I lost my, oh, I've lost my little squeezy thing here. It doesn't seem to matter. Uh, so that's all very well in terms of average variance. Um, does that actually translate into anything useful for prediction? So here is, uh, we're going to start looking at different phases of the MJO now, right? And this is the sort of RMM diagram. So we have two EOFs of OLR. This is from the observations. Um, and projections onto those EOFs will follow around. This is the A phase, the B phase, the C phase, and the D phase. And there's a kind of N zone here where the signal is weak, where the projections are weak. And what I'm going to do is copy some work by Adrian Matthews, where he looked at um, the progression between these four phases of the MGO that he defined. And he, in particular, he looked at um, initial events and successive events. Right? So an initial event is an event which seems to um, just grow, just appear, uh, and then propagate. And a successive event is one that appears to be the continuation of a previous event. So the definition of an initial event, uh, which I've just taken from Adrian, is that it starts with an N moving on to an A. So there's nothing beforehand, and then there's an A phase. And then you have to have a complete sequence, A, B, C, D. Right? And that gets you, that's called an initial event. Right? Now, a successive event starts with an A phase, which comes from a D. Okay, so there was something there before, and you have to have a complete sequence A, B, C, D again. All right, so just remember that. Uh, how are we going to diagnose that from the model? Well, it's a little bit tricky because the model didn't have such great propagation for the OLR. These things are normally defined in terms of OLR. So we're going to define it in terms of the wind because the model did fairly well for, for wind. So the first set of pictures here are for A, B, C, and D phases, and they are the composites of the wind for the four phases of those EOFs, which are based on OLR, in the observations. Okay? So this is the observed wind associated with each of these four EOFs. Well, the two EOFs, but four phases. Okay? Um, we don't want to look at OLR in the model, so what, what we did was to... Um, recompute composites where for each of these phases we project, um, we, we take these patterns which we've deduced from these composites and we project onto those patterns rather than onto the original OLR EOFs. And we get some new composites and, and, and these are the composites from those new, th those are the new composites which are now based on just on wind. And of course, well, they're not the same, it's not exactly the same every day, right? But unsurprisingly, it's extremely similar, all right? This is still just the observations, but now we have a basis based only on the wind. It's not, so we've, we've left the OLR behind, 
And then we can then project the, um, the model onto these composites, right? Onto these, onto these same patterns and, and look at the composites from the model run. And they also look quite similar to the extent that the model run is realistic, but they're not the same. There are some, uh, some differences, okay? So now we can compare sequences, time sequences of phase occupation based on these, on this wind uh, kind of metric um, between the observations and the model. And we'll see, does the, if you have these, this sequence of phases in the observations, does the model produce the same sequence of phases? How does it work? How does it do for the reference run? How does it do with the notch run, which is missing that information from the boundaries? Um, here are, here's a, this is the most beautiful figure I've ever produced, I think. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I think I'll just stop talking for 20 minutes and let you look at it, right? But this, everything is here. Um, the first, so this is all 20 years, 1993, each line is a year to 2012. And the top stripe is the observations um, based on the OLR. The second stripe is the observations based on the wind. And the third stripe is the model. Now, lightening shades of gray denote A, B, C, D phases. If it's white, it's just an end phase. There's nothing happening. Okay? And the colored bands are when we have either an initial event or a successive event. Initial events are warm colors, and successive events are cold colors. So how well does the model correspond to the observations? This is a good example of, how it, of when it works. Here's one of where it misses one. You see, so, and here, here it hits quite well. So we can start to gather some, some kind of traditional forecast statistics on these type of things. Um, and, well, I don't want you to look at this table. I've got a much nicer way of presenting it. But here is the data. Here's where we got, um, um, we collected all the information and decided to assess the result according to three questions that we ask, right? The first question is, how does the model do in just getting the phase right, including the end phase where there's nothing happening? Um, the second question is, well, regardless of phase, does the model manage to get if there's an event or if there isn't an event? So that's just N or not N, right? And then the third is, given that there's an event, how well do we get the phase, right? And so um, for each run, um, First of all, it's just the occupation, the phase occupation, which is pretty much even. Uh, we tuned the thresholds in order to make that so. And then there's the score for A, B, G, C, N. Um, so this line gets 100% in the scores. So it's based on that. This line tells you how well the OLR metric corresponds. And these are how well the model is doing. And so in brackets, you have a Monte Carlo simulation where the years have been scrambled and it's been worked out thousands of times, right? And you expect to be somewhere near 20% for here, somewhere near 65%. So this is what you get from random chance, okay? And so you can see if the model is doing better than chance, and it is for the reference runs, but that's all. For the other runs, it rarely does any better than chance, and not significantly so, okay? So- Left one and left two are virtually the same. Does it mean initial conditions do not play a role at all? Absolutely. I don't think the, issue, the, issue, the initial condition is just a, a, a kick. Tropical initial conditions do not play a role. No, because this is a 20-year run. All right. So after a month or two, oh, okay. you don't care. Yes. You. The, the, the only reason to have that change is to produce two different runs. Yeah. But anyway, that's, that, that's not easy on the brain. So this is a nicer way to look at it. This is the percentage of phase occupation for observation reference. The difference between the reference runs the notch run and the climb run. And here are my three questions. How well does it get A, B, C, D, N compared to chance? And the answer is pretty well uh, for the reference run, but really not very well for the others, okay? How well does it get an event regardless of phase? Um, slightly better than chance for the reference run, no better than chance for the others. And given that you have an event how well do the phases progress one after the other? How well do they line up with observations? And the answer is quite well for the reference run. A little bit better than chance for all the others as well. And I think that's just because it is an internal 
mode of variability. So if you have an A phase, it's likely to follow, be followed by a B phase. You only got to get one of them right, and the others will fall into place. So uh, it's, uh, it's just luck that the event is in phase, but given that the event is in phase, the rest of it should follow. So I think that explains these results. But basically, the reference run rules, and that is another confirmation that you need that MJO timescale on the boundaries to get any kind of correspondence between the run and the, um, and the simulation, between the simulation and the observations. So here's the event skill. So we, I talked about you know hits and misses. So the, there's this, this vocabulary for forecasting hits and false alarms. So the number of primary events we have here um, capture the number of times the model produces a primary event. A number of primary event. I think I called it an initial event. It's when one grows from nothing in the in the simulation, and <clears throat> the the model produces this number of which this number corresponds to what happened in reality. These are false alarms, okay? Um, and, well, it's not very impressive, is it, for these initial events? Um, it's barely any better than the other runs. Um, for successive events, that's where you have a previous uh, event coming through and the, and the model produces one that follows it. It is a little, it is obviously better than the other runs. So. This kind of fits in with, I didn't talk about this, but the expectation is, that what Adrian said in his paper, is that um, initial events tend to start like their life in the tropics, whereas the successive events have some input from the extratropics. And it, that, I think, goes back to what Eileen was just talking about, this, this extratropical route of influence. And uh, so you'd expect a successive event to be more influenced by the boundary conditions, and initial event, uh, the boundary conditions don't seem to be helping very much. Okay, so I think this sort of, it's still, you don't have much skill here, but the little extra skill you have compared to these runs is consistent with that idea. Right? Um, now, if we turn it around, these are observed primary events of which the model gets a very small number. It misses most of the time, okay, but it gets, I mean, it's hardly any better than the other ones, right? Whereas for the successive events, there's clearly a difference between the model, the reference run, and, and the others. Um, so, conclusion. How much longer have I got? 15 minutes? OK. Um, the WARF model produces propagating tropical signals that are weakly coupled to convection. Twin experiments can preserve the model climatology and produce clean assessments of the relative strength of internal versus boundary force variability for a variety of boundary forcing frequencies. Now, this is, I, I quite like this approach because you don't suffer from the difficulty of having the wrong boundary conditions. Uh, and, and so the climatology of the two runs is realistic. Uh, and yet, you still have a measure of the boundary condition independent part of the solution. Um, our experiments point to an important role for MJO band extratropical disturbances in triggering propagating tropical disturbances. Now, we weren't sure what to expect here. I mean, there, there, is some, there, are some, there is some work that shows that stochastic forcing is also important. Uh, so synoptic scale influence adds um, some skill, but and that's not what we found in these experiments. Boundary influence appears to provide an organized upstream precursors. That's from those Hoffmullers, uh, particularly for convectively coupled signals. Now, I didn't show this, but everything I was showing in those correlations was keyed onto OLR. You can also just look at correlations with the wind, and you don't get such a clear answer. It just looks like Kelvin waves going past. Okay? So the fact that we're keying onto convection here is an important aspect of, of this conclusion. Heinz cast skill is poor, but clearly influenced by the boundary conditions, especially for successive events, not really for the initial events. Um, right, so was all this just a badly posed experiment? Um, are we just looking at an echo chamber where we're providing influence from the tropics to, to, to simulate the tropics? Well, I would say no for a couple of reasons. Um, let's go back to this picture. So these precursors are clearly upstream. And it's hard to imagine a, a physical mechanism whereby the tropical solution will influence the boundaries upstream at a previous time. 
So that, that's in my defense. Okay. Further to that, uh, well, I think this is, I thought I'd show you this, because I think this is really neat. This is a paper by Adamis et al. And it's, I think it's a way of, of tackling this issue, because what I've done is just to put the reanalysis on the boundaries. So we put the winds on the boundary, the fluxes on the boundaries, right? What this, this is a novel way of, of, of um, cutting up the solution in the tropics into different components. And what they've done is that they, they think about vorticity and divergence as if they're kind of sources of the flow, right? So the vorticity is like, a, is like the charge for an electric field, which is a stream function, okay? And you look at the vorticity everywhere, you can invert it to find the flow. Well, you need, you need two things. You need the vorticity and the divergence to get the uh, rotational and divergent flow, okay? But you can look at that vorticity in different regions. And if you look at the vorticity, for example, just in the extra tropics and invert it, it will give you the flow globally, including in the tropics. So you'll have a tropical flow which is independent of the tropical vorticity and divergence. So this is what they did. They just looked at the extratropical vorticity and divergence and inverted to find the flow in the tropics, and they call that the background flow. And it's quite weak. It's totally different to the full tropical flow, but you could attribute it to the extratropics objectively in a certain sense. And this is their um, MJO, for when it's over the maritime competent, I can't remember which phase it is. Um, and this is just the background flow they're showing which is consistent with the full tropical flow, and also they have all the teleconnections in this diagram. But that's simultaneously with, um, with presence of convection over the maritime continent. They also showed um, the usual eight-phase diagram. So what we're looking at here is just the background flow. They also did it for, the, for vorticity and divergence in the tropics, and they separated those two components as well. It's, it's a really neat piece of work. So we're, we're just looking at the background flow because it represents the flow in the tropics which is attributable to the extra tropics. And, um, well, these are the eight phases of the MJO. So um, if you look at this one, for example, where it's over the Pacific, there's a very strong extra tropical uh, low. This is stream function, right? Um, associated with that background flow. And so that's the influence of the extratropics in that particular phase of the MJO, which you can then imagine uh, propagates. Okay. Um, and here's something I did earlier, just while Andy was giving his talk. Same uh, MJO phase. Uh, so it's phase eight. And this is this low. So it's also present in the IRA uh, data set. So you don't need to read that paper. You can go and do it yourselves. Right? Um, so this is a fairly strong um, westerly in the tropics, just associated with these stream function um, anomalies. And uh, we can attribute it to the extratropics, right? Another thing, and this is really going back to what Hylin was talking about earlier, and which I will talk about in great detail tomorrow morning, OK? So don't worry too much about this slide. You're going to see this lots of slides like this tomorrow morning, but we have a, a model, we have a, a simple GCM, which is basically the, the GCM that Hylin was showing. I've added a seasonal, an annual cycle to it. Um, and so if you can just think of this as the observations, phi is the observations, psi is the model, and the forcing on the right-hand side of these equations um, is uh, defined by using the observations as initial as a sequence of initial conditions for the model itself. Um, now, I don't expect you to understand that this quickly, because it takes a while to grasp this, but I'll, I'll go into this tomorrow. So what we have is um, some long runs, which include an annual cycle. Um, and so here's the NCEP2 data, which we use to calculate the forcing. And here is the model. So you can see the model has a reasonable climatology in winter and in summer. And so let's look at the tropical variability in that long run. So what we're interested in is the influence of the extra tropics on that tropical variability. So rather than just imposing the, the boundary conditions, we can nudge the extra tropical band, the extra tropical zones, towards 
the observations, okay? Uh, I guess there's only like three people in the room at most who understand this cultural reference here. But uh, we're, we're going to do a nudging experiment anyway. And, and so um, here's the NCEP2 reanalysis. So this is a Wheeler Colardis spectrum of 850 millibar wind, okay? And so you see Kelvin waves, you see Rossby waves, and you can see this big potato here, which is the MJO. This is a free run of the model with an annual cycle. Now, there's not much of an MJO there. There's something, and I'm not, Hylin was showing you something earlier on, and he filtered out all these very fast Kelvin waves that the model has, and just concentrated on what was left here. And it has remarkably a similar structure to the observed MJO, but it's not, it doesn't hold a candle to the strength of the real MJO. At least not with this measure, the 850 millibar wind. Okay, so you don't have much of an MJO in a free-running model. So there's no nudging here. This is the model's own solution. Okay, so then let's nudge the extratropics. This, those are large-scale external Rossby waves. They're Rossby Harwitz waves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They're in the extra trop. Sorry? <laughs> yeah. Well, something in the sponge layer, I guess. So here's an MJO there in the <laughs> there's an MJO there in the observations. I'm saying there's no MJO there in, in with apologies to Hyland, uh, I'm saying there's no MJO there, not to, not to the same kind of amplitude in the model, in the free model. What happens if we nudge the extratropics? Um, so we nudge them outside 30 degrees north and south, and uh, not very cute things on this. Again, no, no difference, right? So we've got observations outside 30 degrees north and south, and not much happening in this dry primitive equation model. Okay, so let's bring it in a bit, bring it a bit closer. Um, outside 25 degrees north and south. And look what we've got. See, now where's that coming from? Um, is it the model's dynamics producing an MJO? I don't think so. I think it's just that we've gone a bit too close with the observations, and that's what the um, spectrum is picking up, even though the spectrum is calculated within 20 north and south. So I'm not just, there's no observations in this spectrum here, but it's influenced. So that's a kind of rough idea of. Don't go too close with your boundary conditions, but close, close enough, right? And of course, I think that would be model dependent, resolution dependent, all that. Yeah. Sure, I'm not saying there's nothing from the extratropics here. I'm saying that there's something from the tropics. You see, I, this, this, there's a risk here that we're polluting our solution with, with observed tropical. Yeah, OK, I get what you mean. Yeah, it could be extratropical. Yeah, yeah. But it's observed extratropical. Yeah, right. yeah sure, sure. OK. But it's, it's a difficult one. I mean, it's, where do you draw the line? That's my, uh, that's my title here. And I, I quite like this Adamis et al. approach, where they, 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 they talk in terms of the the Vortistian of divergence, which is effectively what we're doing here, because this model um, solves the equations for Vortistian divergence. I, I'm nearly done. Um, all right, so this is off topic for this talk, but it's not off topic for this meeting, so I'll just finish with this. You can do it the other way around. Uh, rather than nudging the extratropics, you can nudge the tropics, okay, and look at the model solution in the extratropics. And so here's just a few uh, quick experiments uh, where this is the DJF, um, what is it? It's, the, it's a kind of faux geopotential uh, on the 20 to 90 day uh, frequency band. So it's low frequency variability of the geopotential height field at 250. Um, and this is for DJF in the observations. This is a free run of the model, so no nudging of the tropics. The model has its own tropical solution. And then this, if, if you nudge the tropics, um, this is the variance that you see in the extratropics, uh, and you can see it's quite, quite much, a bit stronger 
much closer to the strength in the observations. Um, so it seems that having a more realistic solution in the tropics has a, an impact on the extratropical solution, at least in winter, um, not so much in spring, uh, although there is some influence, or in summer. Um, although it seems to be a recurring theme in these things that you have this um, strong variance here, which you didn't have so much here. And that seemed, I think there was, was that you, David, showing that earlier, that um, that's one of the, the best responses that the models have to, to an MJO is to, to this variance in the, in the North Pacific. Um, and that, you know, I've, I've reproduced that with the simple model as well. Um, okay, anyway, that was just a kind of show and tell, uh, which has nothing to do with the rest of the talk. But uh, that's where I'm going to stop.